I'm Kevin Brennan from Brennan Brennan Insulation and Airtightness. And who I am and what I am, uh, you guys will know. But one of the things I take great pride in is being a certified passive house tradesperson. I look at being a passive house tradesperson as the top of the pyramid of the skills needed in construction. And one of those basis of skills was taught to me very early on in my career. And it's something I take great pride in and uh, innovating and trying to get to get, get to the top of my, uh, my career chain is this is my history. You guys can get some further insight on listening to the wonderful podcast that, uh, that, that Zach put on for me. And it was a great show. So in 2002, I was at the college of Staten Island and uh, I want, I wanted to get the hell out of here. So I figured out a way how to get a study abroad program to the university of uh, Newcastle in Australia. I love the culture. I love the place. Um, uh, I had great experience. And I, when I was there, I noticed that there was just a kind of like a greater appreciation for the work and hands that were out there. And I, when I came back and I just took a step back, I realized maybe I wanted to get into the trades. So at that time, right after I came back and I had a decent amount of debt when I came back because I took one too many trips and had too much fun. I said, ah, college couldn't hold off. I'm going to take a job at, at uh, I wound up finding myself working for a weatherization agency. And if anyone's not familiar with weatherization, it's a uh, nonprofit kind of like federally funded program throughout the U.S. that fixes people's buildings by using air sealing and insulation. It's kind of like was a driver of building science. The next step in that training program that I was involved in at Northfield through my jobs as being an air sealing installer to the post inspector to the energy order was taking the BPI training. BPI training was great, opened up the world of building science to me, really got my curiosity going of how buildings are built, why they're built, what are the mistakes that they have, how do you solve those problems. And speaking of solving problems, in 2006, I was the very lucky recipient of a phone call and, uh, and, and results on a test that allow me to have the opportunity to serve the city of New York as a New York City fireman. So uh, especially after these past few days with the deadly fire in the Bronx, you really appreciate that you get the opportunity to go out and help people on their worst day. Um, uh, I work in the Bronx and um, luckily my firehouse wasn't there, but um, uh, if, if we were there, we would have done our best to help those people at that time. But some of those problems in that building are kind of air sealing and insulation related. I'm uh, not to really nerd out on that, but um, uh, the compartmentalization of that building probably wasn't where it, really where it needed to be. Um, uh, so I've been a fireman for, since 2006. I, uh, I've been involved in Passive House uh, through working for the Association for Energy Affordability and other places being a trainer and teaching people about Passive House. And in that process of, of uh, teaching people, I had the opportunity to... to uh, talk my way on to actual passive house projects like Mike's and say, hey, we can do uh, dense pack cellulose. That's something we, it's a core competency of ours. And uh, next thing you know, I opened up a business with my brother, Brennan Brennan Insulation and Air Tightness, been going since 2012. And I've had the great pleasure of being a part of this lovely team for the Passive House Accelerator in 2018. And this timeline is gonna continue on. But um, uh, while I was preparing for this, uh, for this lovely uh, presentation, I went back in time in Google Photos and, and went through all my, my pictures of cellulose and the history that I have. So I'm gonna share some of those early pictures that I have. So this is a lovely picture of my good friend, Pete Vento and uh, my, my crew leader at uh, Northfields. There was a weatherization department. That is the cellulose truck with the hose coming out the back, the generators on the street. I'm up in the attic blowing insulation for the Looseville cellulose. That's my brother, Gerard, who, who worked for the company as well. Um, uh, he's taken off siding in a, on a cold day. Um, uh, that's asbestos siding uh, or cement-based siding, not an easy thing to take off, for quite a technical skill, but that was the bread and butter of what we did for uh, the weatherization agency. So our, our crew was kind of like a New York City base, but we kind of like worked on sub, uh, kind of like suburban buildings in Staten Island. So we did a lot of dense pack cellulose, unlike, uh, you know, unlike what people think are the building typology of, uh, of, of kind of like New York City. And that's my man, Dense Pack Pete, right? So we called him Dense Pack Pete because that's what he took great pride in. Um, uh, that was actually a day where they were kicking off the BPI program. Steve Thomas came to town. We were showing off our, all our skills and uh, we, that's Dense Pack Pete there. So he took great pride. Uh, Pete works in energy efficiency right now. I hope uh, he's, he's watching in the crowd or sees a video of this, but uh, I send him this photo all the time. It's a great it's a, it's a great aspect of what it's like to work on a team and uh, people that don't take themselves too seriously, but they take their job pretty serious that they call themselves Dense Pack Pete. So uh, the humility is out of the way. And this is what the real job is. The real job is on the outside of a building, drilling holes, 
on uninsulated buildings or un under insulated buildings, accessing the empty cavities and filling them with uh, cellulose insulation. Um, uh, sometimes this uh, process, doing a pre blower door and a post blower door, we would air seal the building probably between 30 and 50% if we did our, we did a really good job of uh, sealing up the building and doing an attic air sealing. So it's a great opportunity of, of, of what we did. So in 2006, I was, uh, had the great opportunity of joining the New York City Fire Department. I was assigned to Ladder 80. Um, uh, this is one of our training photos. Um, uh, just the, where my career kind of like stopped in energy efficiency. I geared up my career in the fire department. And uh, as a fireman, we work uh, two 24 hour shifts a week. And then we have like three days off in between to, uh, to, to, to work in the trades. And uh, I've always wanted to work and keep my training going and uh, build on my career in energy efficiency. So I was really looking to find my way. While I was trying to find my way, uh, I found my way back to where I took all my BPI training. This is the Association for Energy Affordability up in the Bronx. Um, uh, they had a lovely energy, uh, energy training center. And uh, at, at the training center, we did, we did uh, all, all sorts of trainings on energy efficiency. And then when ARA hit, and, and at that time, we started doing workforce development training. So this is a group of uh, students that come from the Sustainable South Bronx, Majora Carter's uh, group. We did a bunch of training for them. Um, uh, we, that, uh, that, that prop there is showing them how to do some air sealing. And we eventually got to do some dense pack cellulose for them, kind of like a workforce development program. This is another one of our workforce development uh, props. Um, uh, my job at the AEA was to be the air sealing installer trainer. So like kind of like the hands-on uh, trainer teaching workforce development and, and future weatherization uh, employees and current weatherization employees how to do dead pack cellulose well. And as much as I thought I knew, I didn't know, right? So the reality was I wasn't really well trained. I was trained on how to do my job. It was more touch and feel and tradition. It wasn't as science and technique as I learned by working in the props and, and digging down deep into the process of working there. So um, uh, we drill the holes, we, we fill the tube in, and then we dense pack each one of them. You can see that each cavity is, two by four cavity is fully insulated. So what is uh, cellulose insulation? Cellulose, dense pack cellulose insulation and, and why it's good is, in my opinion, it's, uh, it's, it's above 80% recycled content. It is a very low embodied carbon insulation compared to say fiberglass or rock wool or spray foam, uh, some of the other options that are out there. The beauty of the product is, is that you're using the, uh, you're blowing it in and it's filling the whole cavity. So it doesn't care what shape or size it is, whereas other bat forms need to be, uh, come from the factory in the right size. So proper, R value, meaning the cavity is fully filled with insulation. And the R value goes from R3.2 to R4. So um, uh, one of the things I'll talk about in this presentation is finding the right manufacturer that gives you the right R values to meet those levels. Uh, uniform density throughout is the key component of the nozzle man or the nozzle team's integrity. So making sure that the nozzle goes into the right spot, fills the whole cavity, and that you have some quality assurance or ways to check that you're at three and a half pounds to four and a half pounds per, per cubic foot. And I'll show you ways to check that. There's many ways to do it. There's a, uh, and we'll go through that. The picture on the right, you can see that the insulation has been hollowed out of that eye joist uh, two by 12 wall. And that's a passive house level, you know, wall for you know, anywhere throughout the world. So it's maybe super insulated wall, but you can see how the insulation is self-supporting of itself. And that means that it won't settle over time and that the whole cavity is filled through pneumatic pressure. So here we have a uh, here we have a little video of a tour I took of uh, Igloo. It's a cellulose manufacturer up in uh, Montreal, and uh, I'll play the video. I'll play the sound too. Why not? We'll get crazy. So those are the piles of cellulose. It's uh, recycled paper, distributed, and put through. It goes through a machine. The the piles right there are undistributed uh, paper. That's the gold of uh, good cellulose. It comes down to a certain mix and density. It gets put through the processing machine. That's the bagger. Uh, that's the borate, or, uh, or or it could be magnesium. That's the that's the fire retardant and the rotor propellant of the uh, of the of the material. There's the bagger. That's the quality assurance machine. It weighs each bag. My buddy Darren from Suprema, and uh, it's it's a fun experience uh, to see how cellulose is made. So we have. How cellulose is made, recycled content. It's a mix of distributed recycled paper, 
and a, and a, and a better quality paper is undistributed paper, but it's all recycled content. It's not new paper. And then it goes through a treating process that, that, that grinds it down and softens it up. And then it's, it's added into it is uh, anywhere from like 13 to 15% borate. I personally prefer the all borate. Um, uh, some of the other aluminum sulfates, mag magnesium sulfates, I just uh, prefer, I, I, I don't like the corrosive nature of those, um, uh, those products, not like borate is uh, inherently, but it's a road repellent and a fire retardant. So in the picture here, we have green fiber down at the lower left. We have uh, Suprema down at the bottom that says AB, that's all borate. We have Igloo's product in the green. We also have the, the new uh, green fiber sanctuary product on the upper right. And then in the middle, we have the new will product. Uh, I think really it's out of the Midwest and that's a great, great product. So those are all, uh, all, all different brands that I was able to get to New York City and use on my projects. So now we have, how do you choose how much, how much insulation you really need, right? So if I was using uh, fiberglass, I'd go to the distributor and I'd say I have uh, a two by six construction, I've got this eight, eight, 1,200 square feet and they'd sell me how many bundles I need. With cellulose, you gotta do a little bit of math, right? So the simplest conversion is down at the bottom here where you have a two by four and you figure out, all right, I got a two by four construction, how many square feet and what's my coverage rate per bag, 36. That's great when you're dealing with two by fours and two by sixes. In Passive House, we don't deal with two by fours and two by sixes. We're dealing with odd shaped framing, uh, double studs, uh, Larson trusses, uh, eye joists, so it's not as cut and dry as, as we may think. That's why cellulose fits really well into the passive house world is that it, it fills the whole cavity no matter the shape and the geometry and you have to work out a way to get the nozzle in the right spot. So the two tricks to the trade are that the co advanced coverage chart for, on the upper left here by National Fiber and then the residential energy dynamics uh, calculator that I use most often that helps me to figure out how many bags of cellulose do I need and what density am I going for? The general rule of thumb, as you increase in size of the cavity, meaning going from two by, two by four up to two by 10, you wanna increase the density. And I think the maximum density is really recommended is four and a half, um, uh, but you really don't wanna be, be below that. So um, uh, you put it in there, you get your sweet spots, your contingencies, add 10% um, uh, for, uh, for, for just to make sure you, you have enough material on site. And then uh, this, these are all the, the tricks of the tools that I have. So we've got uh, a member of my team, Mike Salufo there. He is uh, putting the tube in the wall, right? So what type of wall is that? That's a wall in a brownstone. Um, uh, so the wall is furred off the wall by one inch. The framing is off. So it's about a four and a half to five and a half inch cavity, depending on how it was framed, if it was square, if it was level. And our goal in dense pack cellulose is to pack that cavity uniformly so that we get throughout that cavity, three and a half pounds per cubic foot. So general rule of thumb is you drill where it's comfortable, like kind of like right at shoulder height. You drill the hole, you feed the tube up to the top, you pull it back by 12 inches, you set the blower up and you blow out all the material in the hose. And then as you go along, I'll show you in the video, you go along and then you fill the whole cavity loose fill. And then once you start to slow down the machine, now you're dense packing at the, tube, at, the, at the tip tube, and then you're slowly being pulled out of, the, out of the hole by friction and pressure and going across. And then you're gonna make sure that you have 100% coverage. So general rule of thumb is if you don't get the tip of the nozzle there, it's where it is, drill another hole. Uh, and that's with, with there. You can use an infrared camera to make sure that's there, uh, that you're on, on, that you've accessed every single cavity, especially when you're blowing behind, say, uh, the, uh, the, the plywood, which is tough to know if you've got the cavity. So that's where it takes a little bit of, uh, nozzle man and backup man, you know, backup integrity to drill the holes for you. And then you also want to keep a, a bag count as you're going along. So if you know you've done seven bays, you want to know how many bags you've done through and across. We'll talk about communications later, keeping the team in, in, uh, in, in line of what's happening that's going across there. So why do we install cellulose as opposed to bats? I feel that bat insulation is, is kind of like an unfair test. Uh, I wasn't really a great student, as you can tell by my, uh, by my uh, college career, but if I'd scored a 95 on a test, I would expect that I did a pretty good job, that I, 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 I didn't get too many errors, but to then go through and realize that I got a 40 on that test, it's not really fair. So what is it? Is it people? Is it process? Or is it products? 
and sometimes it's, it's all the above. So if I can do a process that helps me install it better and easier, I might want to go with those products that ensure that the people installing it are set up for success. And that's why I like cellulose, so that when I'm insulating a wall, I'm using the pneumatic pressure of the machine to make sure that it's fully filled and I'm not getting little gaps and errors going across because I've never met a wall that's perfectly straight or perfectly plumb or level. Um, uh, they always have little tweaks. And when I get material from a factory that's set up, maybe that has some quality assurance issues too. So when you have insulation around electric boxes, they need to be cut perfectly and stuffed in the back. When you have electrical wiring going through the, uh, through the insulation, you want to make sure that uh, that you split. You see, you cut it and you split it. It's 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 not impossible. It can be done, and we do do it from time to time as a contractor. We install rock wool and high density fiberglass bats from time to time, and uh, but the preferred method for us is to do the cellulose because we we find it's a little easier. Uh, it takes a lot of time and effort to do it right. So these are uh, these are pictures of, of of projects that I've worked on. That's uh, that round staircase there is uh, rock wool being put into sound bats. And even though we took our time, it's still not perfect. It still has gaps and compressions. I would say that that's probably around 5% uh, errors. And then the one on the bottom right where the, the faced fiberglass R13 is kind of like squished in place and just stuffed. I would say that's closer to 10% to 20% errors. So the effect of our value is going down even less. Um, uh, I am proud to see that they did insulate where I think a tub is going, but uh, it's still not perfect. So what type of walls are we dealing with most of the time? So most of my work is done in brownstones on the uh, back sink we passive house projects going for passive house. So in the brownstones, our, our front and back walls here are using a, a two, by, two by four stud that is furred off the wall by one inch. Then there's a membrane of some sort. It could be a, an air tightness membrane like Intello or, 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 or Sega's membrane or even, uh, or even Partel's membrane or it could be plywood. So some of the projects work on, the GC likes the plywood. Some of the projects work on, they like the, they like the membrane. So we do whatever the team really wants. And then we fill this cavity with insulation. So this will be a four and a half inch cavity, fully filled with insulation. The hardest thing to get is the, is the space between the studs um, uh, if we weren't using cellulose. <coughs> you can see a better uh, corner drawing here of the cellulose and the studs and the drywall finish. So this would be from the outside, this would be uh, the inside finish. In this picture, we show how the framing works and how the framing is, 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 is in place. It's furred off the wall. And here it's done by at least one inch. Um, it's a little tight to the wall, to be honest with you there. Um, uh, it, it maybe didn't get that full area. And this is a way that we are showing that near the door there, we're almost at five inches of space behind the door because of uh, framing issues and reasons. So um, uh, those lovely little uh, markers there are the PHI printable kind of like insulation depth checkers. Uh, we've been putting them in place just for the, document the documentation process of Passive House. It lets us know that we took a picture and that we're gonna measure, the, we measured the uh, insulation that's there. All right, so we have walls and we have to blow insulation in them. So sometimes on our party walls where we have a fluid applied air barrier and they want insulation for soundproofing or, or maybe some gaps, but they don't need the air barrier that's there um, uh, or the product's not going for certification, but they want some extra soundproofing, we'll put up netting and the netting will act to keep our insulation at bay. The netting is very, it's, a, it, it's different, but uh, it just acts, acts as like a, a, a spring to keep it in. So you can see on the left where it's all blown in. Cellulose is a dirty job sometimes, um, uh, but once it's in, it's, you can touch every area, you can know the, the density of it by touch and feel, and then making sure that that nozzle goes exactly where it needs to go. The next area, next projects that we work on is uh, going behind plywood. So the plywood on some of our projects, it just gives it that extra resilience of during construction, once it's up, it's not gonna get damaged. If you go through it, it's, you have to take a, a saw or, or a sawzall or a hole saw to get through the plywood. Some of the general contractors we work on with the risk of the front and the back wall, they like the plywood, they like the rigidity of it. Their background is being carpenters, so they like to frame walls and, and put up the studs. That man on the right there is, is, is Louis <coughs> from AEA. Um, uh, he is nozzle man, kind of like installation blower extraordinaire. He is, he's, he's wonderful at the nozzle. I had a great privilege of working with him for, for a few years and uh, they did great work, him and Angelo. This is my team. Uh, 
we're we, we're showing the process of that you have to drill the holes that's eva on my team she she drilling the holes and then the dents the holes are filled up there and we got mike up there that's it's going across and, and and dense packing that slope which is probably eight to 12 inches with the two and a half inch uh that's an insulation needle so these are all done with the smaller tube and we'll go through the process all right so the picture on the far left is how you start out doing uh doing cellulose nice and clean no dust with a dust mask on maybe not you know no eye protection on because I'm never going to spray cellulose on, my, on myself. And then in the, in the middle is the process of doing it. So there I'm using an insulation needle, which is a German x flock needle. And I'm weaving it up into the cavity. That cavity is five and a half inches, maybe six inches. And it's putting the insulation in between the membrane and getting it all the way up to the top there. And I'm using the hard tip of the nozzle to make sure that it's going in the upper corners. And I have a certain amount of feel of when it's coming down. And then the picture on the right is the reality of sometimes you do a dirty job and you get dirty and dusty. Um, uh, there's been some evolution in there um, uh, that we use better safety protocols and, and Tyvek suits and, uh, and different respirators just to, because of the nuisance of it. These are all wall types, just a little further explanation of them that they're two by fours, fertile on the wall, cellulose is in here, an air tightness membrane that's here, and the three, four layers of white brick of, of, of going of uh, insulation there. This is a mock-up of a, uh, of a double stud wall <coughs> that we haven't had the luxury of actually doing inside New York City on any brownstones, but the wall that we're building is, is it's not it's a, it's not really like a double stud wall, but it's not far off. We don't need that same full thickness of the uh, double stud itself because of the the attached building on both sides, which are wall types. So nuts and bolts of pass of dense pack cellulose. You want to make sure that your density is at three and a half to four pounds per cubic foot. How do you keep track of that? It's a bag count. It's a square footage coverage, but it's also a quality assurance method method of like touching and feeling when you have membranes opening up areas that taking a piece of plywood off and just checking to make sure that it that it's done uh, properly. And then you can use a thermal imaging camera to find any uh, gaps or or a missed areas. Uh, right here, this is this was blown a few years ago, and they showed that the 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 insulation settled over time. If you have a good crew that has a good machine that's been that's been loved and take care of and has high pressure, the chances of the cellulose settling are few and far between. But if you're going out and renting a machine from Home Depot and doing it yourself, there's a very good chance that that could happen because the rental machines are just meant for loose blow; they're not meant for you know high density uh, dense pack cellulose, and I'll show here again is uh, this is a two by 12 uh, eye joist that is filled with insulation and it's self-supporting. This is the holy grail of knowing if you have uh, dense pack cellulose is that you open it up, you take out the middle and if it can support itself, the weight of itself with you know, 12 inches of it weighing on top of itself that it can handle the pressure of it won't settle over time. We do core samples as well, which I'll get into later. So here we have our cellulose machines. This is this is the the this is this is where the, the the rubber hits the road, right? So we have a few different manufacturers in the U.S. that we're very lucky to work with: Crendel, Cool Machines, uh, in in tech, uh, and then there are a few other uh, smaller distributors that I, I don't know the name. So from uh, right to left, this is Crendel. This one is Cool Machines. This is in tech. Another Crendel. Um, uh, this one is a gas powered machine. And then this is the one that's specially made for RDI, a distributor that uh, kind of like it's a contractor friendly machine. Working in the five boroughs, uh, access, we bring our machine inside so we don't pull up in a truck and just blow from the truck because of access and alternate side and things like that. So we need a, a more mobile machine. So either this machine, the cool machine or the other IDI machine would be uh, beneficial for us if we ever get another, uh, another cellulose machine. So how do you know if your machine's working well, right? So. All the machines either work on generator power, they definitely work on either two, two 15 amp circuits or maybe even three. Uh, my machine that I have works on two 20 amp circuits. Um, if they don't have the right power, they don't operate right. So the electricity is very, very important. And then each day when we start the machine, we make sure that the, from the night before the last time we used it, that it was clean, there's nothing in the hopper. You'd be surprised at what how things can get thrown in the hopper when you're not around on a construction site every day and even when you are. So we check the inside of the hopper and then we check the pressure. We check the pressure with the pressure gauge on the right 
which checks the pressure at the unit. And then the pressure gauge on the left here checks the pressure of the hose and the unit. So say your, your machine was making three PSI, but you had a bunch of leaky hoses or some, uh, some bent fittings, you wouldn't be getting three PSI at the tip of the, of the, of the nozzle itself. So kind of like the general rule of thumb is that you want at least three PSI at the tip or at the machine to ensure that you're dense packing properly. This is my machine in my trailer. Uh, it has an integrated pressure pressure gauge that's on there, lets me know I'm in that sweet spot of the pressure. And here's a quick video of how the machine operates. All right, cellular machine's operating. All right, so as you can tell how the machine operates inside the machine, there's the augers which chew up the, the material and, and, and process from a compact state and they, they start to condition the material. Some of the other machines have a shredder which even kind of like finely shred the material before it gets into what we call the, uh, the chamber, the blowing chamber where the seals are. The seals go around almost kind of like a, like a river boat or so, or, or, or just a chamber that goes around. And then the air pressure gets put across. So what makes the chamber work is the pressure from the blowers. The blowers themselves give it the oomph. So if the chamber that the air and the material are in isn't sealed tight, it loses pressure, it's not gonna be a good seal. So one of the maintenance keys is to check your seals and change them regularly. The other maintenance key is to make sure that your hose is working with you, not against you. As the material goes through the hose, it's building up friction and it should break down the material before it gets to the, gets to the tip. The manufacturers recommend at least 100 feet of hose. Some of them recommend 200 feet of hose. So um, uh, we're always running anywhere from 100 to, two, to, to 200 feet of hose. And then they recommend that you change your hose every six months. Um, uh, we don't work every day blowing cellulose, so um, uh, normally ours is around like every year or two um, uh, on our frequency. I keep hours going across. Tubes. All right, so dense pack tubes. Sometimes you have winter dense pack tubes that the plastic is, uh, is hotter, and it, 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 maybe it's a little, the plastic is a little softer under colder conditions, and it, it gives the ability to bend. And you have summer tubes that are kind of like more rigid, and under warmer conditions will be It'll be, be stronger and, and not bend as much. The, the tube thickness is inch and a quarter and inch and a half. My preferred tube is this Tiger Flex hose here um, uh, that gives me <coughs> a decent amount of production that goes through the, through, through the hose. I am considering getting the two inch Tiger Flex hose. Um, uh, every time you increase the diameter of your hose, you increase your efficiency or your production quite a bit. So from inch and a quarter to inch and a half. And then We've discovered these, uh, these, these nozzles, these uh, X-Flock hardened insulation needles, and they're just a rigid tube that's bent and it helps us get into those deeper cavities. There's a few more videos that'll show you what's going on there. Now, this is a longer video. Let's see uh, the dense pack process behind the wall. Right, so we have the different wall types working on. You guys saw this already. Drilled, I filled up to the top already. Now I'm gonna fill down. I'll stuff the tube all the way down to the bottom. I know at this block that I'm down four and a half feet. I'll pull up around six inches. I'll start the machine and I'll start packing it up. The whole bay is packed loose fill. And now we're going to densely pack it to three and a half to four pounds per cubic foot. So you can see I'm wearing a PAPR and a Tyvek suit there. You get a little tired of getting dusty and blowouts in your face. You see the blowout soon. You wear the PAPR just to keep the dust out of your face and your eyes. Um, uh, it makes working a little more easy. All the way down to the bottom again. All the way down to the bottom. And 
So as it goes in fast forward mode, that extra pack, the, the tube blowing air only, pushes all the cellulose to the side and separates it through pneumatic pressure and gets it all the way down to the bottom. So you're getting a mechanical pack of that and then getting a re-pneumatic pack on your way up. So especially behind plywood. This will follow the machine all the way back. We're up almost three stories on here. And, uh, they're replacing the stairs, which makes access always a lot of fun. Bring you back almost 150 feet of hose there. And this is our machine set up on site inside, working on two different power sources. A little quick image of the of how the agitator operates. This is dense pack cellulose, fully filled cavities, making sure that everything is 100% filled. And that's one of our core samples that measures the, uh, that measures how much, how much density there is. All right. One of the infrared pictures, I'm gonna speed up now. I'm uh, hopefully you get through all this. I know I'm uh, a little backed up on time, but this is a way that we keep we keep track of, uh, of, of which cavities are being, be, being next that we don't skip, especially when you go to lunch or you take a break. The friction in the machine uh, it builds up heat. And when you install the insulation in it, it goes in slightly warmer. And the infrared camera is just a great way to make sure that you didn't miss any, uh, any bays or nooks or crannies or odd framing members. <clears throat> one of the lovely hazards of cellulose is static electricity. Um, uh, one of the tricks of the trade is to throw a little graphite inside the machine to make it smoother. Uh, but on a low humidity day, the static electricity, sometimes it, 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 it gets you no matter what. And it always gets you when you're least expecting it. Ah, wow, that, that hurt. Um, uh, and it's uh, always, it catches you off guard. This is one of our, uh, one of our, one of the benefits of doing cellulose is that in a passive house project, it helps you find some of your leakage. The hole there. So we've got all the benefits of cellulose. Now, how do you keep track of density? So this, this, uh, this chart was put together by uh, somebody that I consider a, a mentor and a friend in the industry, Bill Holstrick. Uh, he, he used to work for National Fiber. The man was a jack of all trades when it came to cellulose. He knew everything from the machines to the product to the process and really supported the guys in, in the field that were doing the work. I was at the national weatherization, uh, kind of like regional weatherization uh, competition, where it was kind of like a like a rodeo. And he helped one of the teams win the competition. He tuned their machine. He checked their pressure. And uh, I had a little bit of uh, envy that we we didn't participate in it, but we, they had a, they had a really good coach. So um, uh, Bill was a great coach. And then knowing where the world was going and deeper cavities and higher densities, he created this chart. And uh, I've been using it ever since and uh, have a, it's been a staple of my practice. So one of the things that we do on every project is we do core samples. I, I choose an area that I know is hard to work. I'm uh, either low, high, up on a ladder that maybe I'll take a mark on, on the wall or when we know we took lunch and we'll open up that area and we'll check the density. So we open it up, we measure it, we weigh it. Then we measure the five inch cavity, 69 grams. That comes out to 4.2 pounds per cubic foot. So I'm confident that right here at the hardest level that we have hit our density. This is our density check station. We use lunch bags, right? So rather than putting them in and hand stuffing them, we just take paper paper bags, put them in, paper's paper, and uh, stuff them back into, in, in, into the cavity. And there's no uh, vapor density uh, change whatsoever. We blew up the chart, we added a logo, but I do give Bill credit for creating the chart. Um, uh, but it, it's a part of our, our practice and our process. This is mainly here to make sure that nobody else, uh, that, that nobody throws it out on us really. So here's a quick little exercise of the technique and the technology of Passive House is that we have a six inch cavity weighing 102 grams. We would go to the six inch here, follow it all the way down and we'd see what our gram weight is here on the scale. And we'd know that at six inches, we're greater than five pounds per cubic foot. 
So this is just the proving, showing you guys how you would use that chart. Not rocket science, but uh, but sometimes you just need a little bit of hand holding. All right, we're at uh, Pastor Mouse Project. Another video. Street. We're doing uh, dense pack cellulose here in the walls and the ceilings. Uh, we'll go downstairs and take a look at the machine. Pretty typical of our projects. So I'm Mike Lowe, the cellulose machine. Nice, nice, cool machine. It's the 1500. We're blowing in uh, Suprema Cellulose from Canada. Very nice product, clean cellulose. Comes all the way through. All borate is uh, the AV. I think that's the important part of the product differentiator. Timmy's drilling holes there, opening up so that when we move to the next floor, it's open. He's on the second floor. We're up on the third floor. That's our insulation needle. Our density check station. We got our scale and our four inch dryer vent pipe. And Kelly's blowing in with the ventilated rotary knob. Our goal is uh, three and a half pounds per cubic feet up in the ceiling. Kelly's got it up there. The ventilated rotary nozzle is a German X block nozzle. It uh, helps to blow in at the end, puts the tube fill. Nice process. All right. This is the X-Lock nozzle. So in my training, I went over to Ireland and uh, had a met a good friend that hopefully I'm able to get on the show. His name is Roman. And uh, he's, he's, he's a, a German guy working in Ireland doing dense pack cellulose and passive house work. And, uh, you know, we just instantly at the training had, had like a bond, like, oh, what kind of, what kind of machine do you use? Like, oh, what's this? And we shared knowledge, knowledge and back and forth just by traveling outside of our borders, realizing that there's other cellulose man, man, machines and manufacturers out there, discovering that, that the, the x Flock brand is out there, you know, innovating and really kicking the cellulose world to the next level of, uh, of, of those thicker wall assemblies and everything. So this is the S-Jet. The S-Jet is kind of like the tube fill method with the, the, the rotary nozzle on it. The tube goes in and down, just like we would take the dense pack nozzle, but it's doing it at a larger size hose. And then as you come up to the top, you do the ventilated size. It's dust free. It's, it's a nice, we have it um, uh, and we use it quite regularly, um, uh, but it's a, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a great innovation and project. So this is the ventilated rotary nozzle in practice. It, uh, to be honest with you, it works a little better in solid cavities. So if you have two by tens or two by twelves and you're blowing small little cavities like Mike is here, it's really good at doing that. Um, uh, whereas we're a little bit more used to getting the flexible tube and getting a little more tactical feel inside the cavities with, uh, with, with this, the smaller dense pack tubes when we have open cavities, say trusses or, 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 or double stud or fur it off the wall stud. We have the ventilated rotary nozzle, show them the flange, pull it out, got the little lock, locks in, got a bag. The bag is act as the air, the air lock for the uh, nozzle, goes in, it's got a curve to it, spin it around Tim, show them how it spins. All right. So he's got the nozzle in the in the bay these are solid plywood box golf uh kind of like cathedral ceilings each one is about two or three feet see the bags inflated the nozzles pointing this way So it's fully filled. They're done. We'll just take a little, a handful, and, and plug that hole. This is the uh, X Flock insulation needle. You can see how it's got a curve to it. And Timmy's going to poke it in the wall to show how you get a fat cavity filled with insulation. He takes the tube and he's, he's angling it. That's why the tube has an angle. It, it gives you the, down the bottom there. Now go to the other side. This is the uh, x flock insulation. And this one's just doing a different cavity. It's going up. It shows that the tube is going up and up and to the right at the top. He can feel it. You can touch it. You know where it is. 
and uh, it's just a, a, a pretty good way of doing a larger cavity quicker and faster because cellulose is all about production. I'm doing two and a half inch opening and getting that hard nozzle into the spot. It helps me to be more productive than working with the inch and a quarter nozzle that would be. So one of the other tricks of the trade of doing cellulose are these density boxes. Uh, these are two by four density boxes. Um, uh, this is more for home performance or residential work. Whereas you'll be setting your machine up to know what your settings are, your air pressure and your gate to do two by four walls. And the how it works is that you'll, this is this, this two by four uh, box is uh, two cubic feet of volume on the inside, three and a half inches. And when you blow it at dense pack, three and a half pounds per cubic foot, it should increase by seven pounds. So you should take that, dense, that density box, weigh it with a fish scale or a, a, a bathroom scale, and then you would know that it's at the right density. It helps you set your machine up. One of the things we'll be doing in the future is creating density box checks that represent our walls, either with Intello or, or say plywood. And then the trick of the trade is once you blow that density box, uh, density box is that you think you did a good job before you weigh it, you take off the cover and you hold it above your head. And if you didn't do such a good job, you get a cellular shower. Um, uh, and then if you did a great job, you, 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 you did it. That's the kind of like tradies uh, rite of passage, I guess you could say. <clears throat> In our projects, we also do not only walls, but roofs. This is a 17 inch cavity. When we do the 17 inch cavities, most of it, that's an eye joist, that one. Um, uh, we really have to spend a decent amount of time making sure that you get the nozzle in the right spot and doing those density checks. That's where those uh, insulation needles really come in handy. We've done other cavities that are up to 24 inches. This is a garage ceiling in a pass house project in Harlem, multifamily project. We did 24 inches of dense packed cellulose in this area. We've got almost an entire tractor trailer filled with cellulose and the logistics of it. Luckily it was in an overpass and a garage because we were able to store the cellulose in the garage area. Um, uh, and it was, uh, it was fun. And we used some of, the, uh, some of the membrane to keep the dust down and help us from, uh, from picking up, from having to clean up. One of our other tricks is to put up membrane as opposed to drilling holes in the plywood, um, uh, that gets tedious and, and, and laborsome. We throw up a membrane or a netting and then we'll blow through that and then we'll peel that down and put back up the, uh, the, the plywood that goes in there and tape the seams. So this is a trench method is what we call it. Whereas we go left, we'll go right. And we can do almost an entire ceiling with two trenches and a few holes rather than having to drill a hole every single one and then patch them. So it's uh, one of those things. The key to getting cellulose machines to work is regular maintenance, just like uh, just like an, uh, an airplane, hours, how many hours has the machine been running? And then change, change put your lube in, in, in the gear, the gear oil in the right spots and change your seals. The one in the middle is a split seal. When you run your cellulose machine and you see volcanoing and things that are, uh, that, that are popping out means that you have air leaks and you should change your seals regularly. The thing I like about the cool machine is that it's, it's rather easy to work on. Um, uh, we're able to take out these augers, dis disconnect the chain rather easy, change the seals without, you know, having to do acrobatics and getting under a 200 pound machine. And uh, it's, 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 it's nice, uh, nice to work on. This is our setup, our hoses that get changed regularly going across. This is our machine inside. We have a cover making sure that the team that we're working with isn't throwing, you know, like putting a, a screwdriver on and it winds up in our machine that uh, don't ask me to know how that happens. This was, uh, this is our setup when we had the luxury of being able to park for a few hours in front of the fire hydrant and uh, listening very closely to make sure that you're not blocking for a fire. But we had, this is our, our setup there. Logistics. So having a good partner that could do, deliver for you um, uh, is important. Delivering pallets, quick, fast, efficient, and then having uh, a good crew of guys ready to, uh, ready to offload and get it in the building without uh, too much distress and despair. Um, uh, so we use IDI here in, uh, in, in, in New York uh, uh, from Long Island. We have purchased half trailers and full trailers worth of cellulose. It just tends to be a little troublesome on uh, the logistics and the warehousing and you know renting a forklift to load the trailer or, or the truck itself. Uh, the other way to keep track of how much progress you have is keeping track of how many square footage you covered and how many bags you've done. The uh, hashtags, the uh, hash marks on the side here is, is our daily production. Um, uh, this is our daily pressure test or PSI. 
we got 108 delivered. We had 100, we had 10 from the garage. This is who was working. And it's kind of like a challenge to see if we can beat the other day's production. Safety. So full rate is not technically uh, on the list of a, of, of, of a respiratory hazard, but it is kind of like a newsome in that if you blow it every day, it can dry out some of your skin and make it irritated or so. So over the past few years, we've met, I've, I've, as the owner of the company, I've just kind of like implemented good safety protocols, which means Tyvek suits to keep the dust off your clothes. So you go home and you're not covered in it. And then the respirators, making sure you're either using a, a full face piece respirator to protect your eyes or the PAPR just to make it a little easy to work on. And that goes for not only blowing cellulose, but also installing rock wool. Everyone's got their Tyvek suits on, they got their gloves, they, their, their respirators are on. You're working above your head, you're looking up. It's very easy to get things in your eyes and you get something in your eye, you're, you're shut down for five minutes. It's a production hazard more than anything else. Other parts of safety are uh, this negative air machine, creating dust. You wanna control the dust and bring in fresh air to keep that across. So this is a HEPA filter, uh, collect the dust, just take a negative pressure, keep, keep the, the, the dust from being in one zone to the other and lighting. To me on construction sites, lighting is the biggest hazard because um, uh, even though it's under construction, they put up temporary lighting, it's never perfect where you need it. So we always have temporary lighting. And the last part is communication, right? A funny picture, the guys that are able to work with me, but we have these walkie talkies and we talk like, like we're at the firehouse. Nozzle to control, um, uh, you got 15 bags left, all right? I think I have a clog. I think I have a clog. He checks the machine. We shut it down. We purge the machine. It prevents us from, from having to break down the hose and chase leaks. And communication is important, especially when you're working with a limited man uh, crew. Somebody falls off a ladder, twists their leg. You want to stop right away, be able to help them. So we work with uh, radios and, and voice mics and things like that. It's important. And then the last part of the presentation is kind of like the lessons learned of quality assurance while walking around with the thermal imaging camera, checking for, uh, for and we missed any bays or, or, or cavities or so, we noticed this, uh, this, this cold spot in our insulation in the ceiling. And we were like, what's going on there? And what we didn't realize was that the permanent roof wasn't on. So the roof wasn't on, wasn't the permanent roof, it was just a temporary roof on the top and they developed a water leak. And the water leak was showing through the cellulose. So then we had to take out all the cellulose that was up there and we needed to do it. But the, the thermal imaging camera kind of like helped us find it. And then it wasn't such a big deal because the drywall wasn't up. It was just a few bags, a patch, a pole and a replacement, just took out everything that was wet. Once they put the final roof on, then we went back and we, we, we redid the work. So kind of like the lesson there is to don't blow cellulose in a brownstone roof unless it has the permanent roof on or the temporary roof that's the underlayment or something that's a little more durable than what's currently up there. So I just wanna thank you all for that presentation. I think I've used all the time I possibly had. Boom.